Thank you so much for participating in the Sea of Red uh, series. I hope you've enjoyed this series. It's been a, a journey f through John chapter 14, 15, 16, and 17. John is the fourth book in the New Testament. He is one of the apostles. Uh, it's one of the four gospels, which is the life of Christ. And, and John is Jesus's best friend. So he has massive insight into the life of Christ. And the reason we call it the Sea of Red is that oftentimes in the Bible, the words of Jesus are printed in red. So, you know, oh, you know, you know oh, I'm supposed to pay attention now. And truly, uh, the John 14, 15, 16, 17, you open that all up, it's completely red. It's almost, almost except for just a little bit, uh, it's all in Jesus' words. So we're closing her down today with the last chapter, and again, of, of this uh, section and John uh, is recording these words to Jesus right before Jesus is going to the Garden of Gethsemane. Judas is left. He's going to go get the authorities. He's going to show up at the garden where Jesus is going to be at, and he's gonna, they're going to arrest Jesus. And we know the rest of the story uh, gets pretty messy from here on out. Now, one of the things I like doing is uh, I like listening to people pray. When you pray out loud, all that stuff, you, you learn about them. I always uh, encourage uh, if you're married, you should pray with your spouse, pray out loud with your spouse. A lot of people look at me like, that's just dumb. Uh, but it, it truly is, I think, one of the best things you can do for your marriage is you'll learn to, what's on each other's hearts. I love listening to my wife pray, and still all this time. Uh, we've been together. When she prays, it's super clear uh, what she cares about. And, and right now, it's mostly thankful stuff and family things and our church. And so it's just great. When we have elders meetings, I love listening to those uh, elders pray, and then I know what's on their heart. I, I, I was thinking about uh, my friend Mike McCreary, and, you know, who's passed away, but, but I love listening to Mike pray. And oftentimes, and this would surprise many of you who uh, might have known Mike, uh, he oftentimes cried when he prayed because he was talking about his kids or lost people. And I always knew that Mike, uh, there's uh, two things that Mike cared about more than anything else in the world was uh, lost people and his family. And uh, so the, uh, we always, always thought that Mike was super tough. Being an FBI agent, uh, he was actually a wuss. And uh, so he, he truly, truly loved people. And, he, and, uh, and so when I hear people pray, it just really is powerful. Listen to this prayer. We thank you for your church founded upon your word that challenges to, to more than sing and pray. But to go out and work as though the answer to our prayers depended on us and not upon you. Help us to realize that humanity was created, shine like the stars and live on through all eternity. Keep us, we pray, in perfect peace. Help us to walk together, pray together, sing together, live together until that day when all God's children, black and white and red and brown and yellow, will rejoice in one common band of humanity in the reign of our Lord and our God, we pray. Amen. Martin Luther King, Jr. Here are some other prayers. Dear God, please make my mom not allergic to cats. I really want a cat, and I don't want my mom to move out. <laughs> Dear God, can you get me a smartphone? Santa must have forgot. Dear God, when will my sister stop being annoying? I am down to my last patience. So here today, we're going to listen to, to a prayer that Jesus prayed. And again, let me just remind you, he is on the way to being arrested this is on his heart, and, and we get a, a little glimpse. John chapter 17, verse 13. So he's talking to God. Now I am coming to you. I know this is it. It's almost over. I told them, so he's talking about the disciples. I told my disciples many things while I was with them in this world so that they would be filled with my joy. I have given them your word. And the world hates them because they do not belong to the world. So if you're feeling a little pressure, it's because you don't belong to the world. Right? The world doesn't understand, doesn't like, and will get after you. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. 
They do not belong to the world any more than I do. Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. Just as you sent me into the world, I'm sending them into the world. Here's the purpose. And, I'm, and I give myself as a holy sacrifice for them so they can be made holy by your truth. I am praying not only for these disciples, but also, so this is for us, but also for all of you who will believe in me through their message. This is not just for those guys I've been with. It's for everybody who ever will ever believe in my message. So this is for us today. I pray that they will all be one. Here's this prayer for you and for me. Pray that they be one, just as you and I are one. As you are in me, Father, I am in you. And may they be in us, so that the world will believe you sent me. I've given them the glory you gave me, so that they may be one as, uh, as we are one. I am in them, and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know. Here's the purpose for uni being uni uh, unified as a church, as believers. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as I love uh, as you love me. Father, I want these whom you have given me to be with me where I am. Amazing. Then they can see all the glory you gave me because you loved me even before the world began. Oh, righteous Father, the world doesn't know you, but I do. And these disciples know you sent me. I have revealed you to them and, and will continue to do so. Then your love for me will be in them and I will be in them. A few little glimpses here in the prayer of Jesus. First of all, he asked them to protect. I want God, I want you to protect them from the evil one. Don't take them out of the world, but protect them while they're in the world. One of the things that oftentimes happens to followers of Jesus, especially after we've been around for a while, is that we tend to drift towards creating heaven on earth. We would like, you know, you know we, we want... We want life to be great, right? And to be perfect and, and no pressure and all that kind of stuff. Um, and if I can just surround myself with good and godly people, I won't sin anymore and it will be heaven on earth. Have a nice Christian bubble around us. But Jesus calls us not to have a, a Christian bubble around us, but he calls us to be in the world. Not to be worldly, but to be in the world. We're going to make a difference. We're going to shine out, as Martin Luther King Jr. expressed in his prayer. We're going we're to shine out. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 1. Dear brothers and sisters, when I was with you, I, I couldn't talk to you as I would to spiritual people. I had to talk to you that belong to this world or though you were infants in Christ. I had to feed you with milk, not with solid food because you weren't ready for anything stronger and you still aren't. For you are controlled by your sinful nature. You are jealous. So here's the, if, if, if we need to figure out, am I, am I still kind of in the world stuff if, or have I come out of that? Well, here's the markers for that. You are still controlled by your sinful nature. You are jealous of one another and quarrel with each other. Doesn't that prove that you're controlled by your sinful nature? Aren't you living like people of the world? People of the world are jealous. Jealousy is a, is a trademark of worldly people. Proverbs 14, 30 says, a peaceful heart leads to a healthy body, but jealousy is like cancer in the bones. Proverbs 27, verse four, anger is cruel and wrath is like... A flood, but jealousy is even more dangerous. James 4, 2, you, you want what you don't have and you scheme and kill to get it. You are jealous of what others have, but you can't get it, so you fight and wage war and take it away from them. Yet you don't have what you, don't, uh, what you want because you don't ask God for it. And even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong and you only want uh, what gives you pleasure. Jealousy just wreaks havoc in relationships, doesn't it? Have you ever dated a girl that was jealous? Super fun. <laughs> right? Because she's like, who are you talking to? Why did you talk to her? Why, is it like, oh, why, why don't you like me? Mm -hmm. What do you think of my clothes? Uh, I don't know. I'm out. <laughs> right? Because it's just horrible, right? It's like, let me see your phone. What? Okay, yeah, no. Jealousy wreaks havoc in any kind of relationship, whether it's a relationship with a girlfriend or you all of a sudden become jealous of a, a co-worker? What do you think is going to happen in that relationship? What if, a, what if a pastor becomes jealous of another pastor? 
That's dangerous. Distrust feeds jealousy. So Jesus prays that they would be protected from the evil one. Satan will do his very best to sabotage a marriage, a friendship, a church, a mission. We're being sent into the world just like Jesus was sent. Jesus, and I love this about Jesus. I, I'm still trying to figure this out. Jesus was massively comfortable with people who were far from God, from tax collectors to prostitutes. And that was amazing about Jesus. But what was even more amazing to me was they were super comfortable around Jesus. He didn't make them feel uncomfortable. He made the religious people feel uncomfortable. But he was super comfortable around people who were far from God. They were super attracted to him. You're going to need the Holy Spirit's protection if you're going to be out there sharing your faith with Christ. Be in the world, but don't be worldly. Another part of Jesus' prayer was uh, to, to be unified. He prayed that we would be one. John 17, 20 talks about that. Is that he, I, hey, I'm praying. So that just like you, God, and the, uh, my Father and I, we're, we're one. I want, every, I want us all to be unified. And as a result of that, of being unified, people will be attracted to that. So how are we doing on that one? I don't think so well. You know what's massively confusing to people outside of the faith of Jesus? All the denominations that we have. You can go through all kinds of stuff in the phone book. You're like, what about this one? What about this one? What about like, you know, and we're a little suspect of those guys. We're not even sure some of those are going to get to heaven. In fact, we're going to be surprised probably. Like, what are you doing here? You went to the second or third or the fourth Baptist church. I didn't think you guys were getting in. Right? Have you ever played that game where you're like, what is going on in the Christian community when we can't even get along with each other? I don't know. In our little denomination that we're a part of, and I know we're not... It's like, wait a minute, I thought we were non-denominational. Well, we're non-denominational denomination. <laughs> Meaning we're really bad at this. Meaning we don't have retirement. <laughs> we're not organized very well. Our union is not very strong. So, we're a non-denominational church that got started back in the 1800s as a movement of people who were trying to figure this out. And what they said was, hey, let's not be Baptist or Episcopalian or Lutheran or Catholic anymore. Let's just be Christians and Christians only. We're not the only Christians, though some of us believe that, but, but we're just going to try to be Christians and Christians only. And what would unite us would be, hey, let's, let's, let's get united on the word of God and that Jesus is the son of God. Fairly simple. In fact, I would say that that's it right still to this day. We had this little saying in essentials, unity, in non essentials, liberty, in all things, love. What are the essentials? The Bible is the Word of God, Jesus is the Son of God. That's it, right? And we got to be fairly solid on that. But unfortunately, I don't know. We don't always take the Bible that seriously. I like to say that we take the Bible seriously around here. We just don't take ourselves too seriously. Meaning we truly believe in 2 Timothy 3 verse 16 that all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong. So here's the purpose of the Bible. To teach us what is true and to make us realize what's wrong in our own lives. The Bible is not there to prove what's wrong in your life. It's to prove what's wrong in my life. We get that messed up. I thought the Bible was to prove what's wrong in your life. By the way, a lot of people like the Bible now that didn't used to like the Bible. Have you noticed how much the Bible is getting thrown around in the political world? I'm like, yeah. I don't. I, see, I think what you're using the Bible for is to get your way. You like this part of the Bible, hate that part of the Bible. See, what we have to be united, like if it's the word of God for this, it's gotta be the word for God for that, and that's why it's massively confusing, because we tend to pick and choose the sins we like and don't like, which makes it this. This is what the philosophy of our world today is. It might be wrong for you, but it's not wrong for me. You know what that just made me? The writer of the Bible. 
I get to choose what's wrong for you and what's not wrong for me. And I'm the authority. That's massively scary to me if you're choosing that, from, right? It's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Where's your true source? Because I know you're not God. I know for sure you're not God. And you're picking and choosing what you want to believe about the Bible? Okay, well, good luck with that. That's crazy. And so what happens when we get to pick and choose what we like in the true source of the Bible is basically saying is, that, well, uh, if it feels good, I can do it. God wants me to be happy. This makes me happy. Uh, or survival of the fittest. Or go for all the gusto. All of a sudden, he who is, has the most toys ends up winning. Pick whatever philosophy you want, whatever it works, except for the fact is that we're not God. Here at Stonebridge, we have chosen to have the word of God to be our truth source. Therefore, we believe the Bible to be true. Now, it might be difficult to understand. We're still trying to figure it out. But if all of a sudden we begin to teach that the, the virgin birth really didn't happen or the resurrection of Jesus Christ didn't happen or the miracles didn't happen, then we would begin to split the church over those kind of things. We have to be united on the word of God and on who Jesus is. We believe that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God and that he died and rose again. Simple. That's essential to us. There's just a couple. In non-essential beliefs, we have liberty or freedom. We might not agree on so all the, all the things, right? And that's okay. And I tend to think, you know, like, well, what's the, how do I determine what's non-essential? Well, here's how I do it. Let's just say that, uh, that I'm up, I'm, I died and I'm at the gates. And Peter's there and he says, hi, Mark. Um, yeah, sorry about the accident. Kind of messy. Uh, but uh, it is what it is. So you're here. Um, let me ask you a couple of questions. Uh, did you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and he is, was he your Lord and Savior? And he's like, yes, he was. Hey, that's good. Okay, good. Whew. One more question. Okay. Um, did you let women serve communion in your church? Uh, um, yes. <clears throat> Go to hell. I was super clear about that in the Bible. I didn't want women serving the communion. You know that. Who was your pastor? Uh, um, it was me. Like, okay, this was totally out of bounds. Now, see, that sounds funny, but we've had people leave our church because we let women serve communion, which I thought that was, again, I made them say it out loud, but that was true. And... Um, well, they were okay with women cleaning it up. And maybe putting the juice in the little glass. But don't get us started down the row. That's way out of bounds, and we're leaving your church. Okay, well. Um, hmm. By the way, we now have woman elders, so I'm sure that's going to tick you off too. You're like, well, see, there's a lot of things that we don't have to agree on. We still get to go to heaven. If you don't like that, that's fine. You can go to another church. That's fine. I, I truly, that's fine. We, Stonebridge Christian Church is not going to fit everyone in every slant. It's this won't. And that's okay with me. And there's lots of great churches in our town that you would probably be more happier with. Okay. And if you can support your position with, with the Bible and I can support my position with the Bible, you're like, well, I don't agree with you, but I like, don't really get where you're seeing that from, then that's fine. Or we might not agree on how the end times is going to work. You might, there's, there's going to be this thousand year reign. He's going to grab a bunch of people and sh ship them up to heaven. We're like, whoa! <laughs> and we don't know how that's all going to work. You might, you might, like, I think Jesus was a premillennialist. I think he's a post millennialist. Yeah, well, you're an idiot. I don't know. You know, it's like, see, we, we fight over all kinds of dumb stuff. And the world goes, what is wrong with you people? Well, all right. All right. See, in non essential beliefs, we should have liberty. But in all things, we should love each other. 
You're my brothers and sisters in Christ if you believe that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God. You might not agree with me on every little theological issue here, but you're my brother and sister, and we need to get after it to help save the world for Jesus. So let's get away from denominational labels and, and uh, taglines and uh, turf wars and whether or not we think you're right. Let's just believe that Jesus is our Savior and let's get after it because we're, we're supposed to be in the world to change the world and we're supposed to get after that. And all things we should love enough that we can work alongside each other to bring about the redemption of the world. In verse 24, he says that, uh, uh, that his prayer, the love this, is uh, Jesus prays, I want these guys with me, right? I want them in heaven with me so that the, they're going to be able to see the glory of God someday. Isn't that a great prayer? That I want them with me. My guess is you pray the similar prayer for your family members who are far from God right now that someday you would see them cross the line of faith and that you would be welcome. And, that, and, and, and someday that would be our prayer for you as well, that they would find their way to Jesus, whether it's at this church or someplace else. I love it when people come up and tell me, you won't believe what happened, right? And like, what? It's like, yeah, my brother came to Christ. Like, what? And like, yeah, seriously, that's all. My husband found his way to Jesus. Wow, I bet you've been praying about that for a long time. Yeah, since we first started dating 23 years ago. Oh, I'm so glad that happened. Because I know you pray about it all the time and you think about it all the time. It might be for your kids. It might be for your grandkids. It might be for your coworker. It might be for uh, a guy that you play softball with. It, uh, you, it's just part of who you are. You pray for, I want them with me in heaven. By the way, when you pray that prayer, here's what I think happens. I don't think that God magically, all of a sudden, oh, I'm going to heaven. You know, no, what he does is he makes you a different person makes you a different person, doesn't make them a different person, makes you a different person so that perhaps someday you will engage, you will be bold enough to engage them in a conversation about Jesus. You might be bold enough to invite them to come to church service with you. Or it might be that you somehow answer somebody's prayer who's praying right now in North Platte, Nebraska, and because their college age daughter just started going to UNO and you happen to be in the dorm room with her and you said, would you like to come to church with me? And you just answered a mom and dad's prayer. Because you want just what Jesus wants. That all people, all people would find their way to God. So much so that it might even compel you to, to, to go on a mission trip to Mexico or India or Ecuador. Because not only do you care about the lost people in Omaha, which by the way is a whole lot of people, eight out of ten Nebraskans don't go to church. They don't. And they won't be like, like what? Eight out of ten? Well, I'm, it's worse than Iowa, by the way. So it's like, no, I'm just kidding. Um, but... What is true is we truly know that that's true in our city. And by the way, when you see your friend get baptized, it'll blow you up and you will change your heart forever. So much so that you'll think, you know what, I think I should go to Ecuador with her church or maybe to India with her church. And all of a sudden your world went from here to, right? Because for God so loved, who? Who? The world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever, whoever would believe in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. And I know that some of you have kids right now in a foreign land who are taking the, the gospel of Jesus Christ to people who are far from God. And you're trying to hold it together today. Because when you had communion right now, you were thinking of your boy, you were thinking of your girl, and you were thinking of the lost people that they were going to impact by this week of ministry or this month of ministry that they're on right now. 
in just a few short weeks, or, uh, we have a team of people going to Ecuador. You know how that started? With a prayer. With a prayer. It's still Jesus' prayer for you and for me, that we would be a part of the redemptive potential for our community and for our world, and that we play a small part of it. Oh, my, did you... Uh, I love the fact that we had 400 plus kids this week in, in our uh, little camp. And by the way, what an amazing group of people. I went to every campus and uh, our volunteers were amazing at every single campus. I'm so proud of them. They were so engaged in the life, so much so that they are exhausted even still to this day. They poured everything they had. They worked a whole bunch of hours, and then they showed up for a couple hours every single night to share the love of Christ, and it messed them up. They care about your kids. They care about your kids and your neighbor's kids and all the children of the world. All right. Uh, I need to pray. Father God, thank you for this moment in time. I thank you so much for our church. I thank you that you gave us your word for the Bible. We're grateful for it. May we take it seriously and may we honor it by obeying it. Help us to be one as a church united on thought and purpose around our mission to share Christ and build believers in our communities wherever we're planted in. May we take the gospel to Omaha and Millard and Fremont, but let's not stop there. For our state, we love this place. We know that there are many people in our state that are far from you that need a vibrant and exciting church. So I pray for the churches and our communities that they would be strong. I'm grateful for today, for churches like LifeGate, Westside, Christ Community, for First Baptist Church, Greater St. Paul, I hope they all have a good day today. Pray for their pastors. You give them courage and boldness. Help them to hang in there. Protect them from the evil one. In Christ we pray. Amen. All righty. So glad you're here. Uh, Next weekend we start Mass Exodus, and we're starting it right now. You can leave.